Hello, brethren. It is good to be with you again. We continue in our Sunday morning study of an overview of the Old Testament. The Bible, as our owner's manual, needs to be understood and well used, and we should be able to use it to our profit to maintain this wonderful thing that God has given us, uh, to live the lives that would honor him and live lives that would ultimately allow us to have eternal life with him in heaven. He has given to us truly all things unto life and godliness. That is, everything we need to know in order to live our lives here well and to live eternally, he has given to us, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. And so we're studying the Old Testament in particular, and we're trying to understand two main things, where each book fits in chronologically, that is, into the history of mankind. These aren't ethereal books that are just out there. They occurred at certain times. They were given in response to certain events. Uh, they detail or, or give us a history of specific events. They are real. It's not fiction. This are, these are real things that were given from God to his people throughout time. And so that's what we have. But we're also trying to understand why these particular books were given to us, how they contribute. God could have written everything in the world. And as John says, you know, if we wrote down everything that Jesus said or did, there might not be enough room in the world to hold all the books. So God has cho chosen these 66 books and these 39 books of the Old Testament and said, that's adequate, that's enough, so that everyone can know. Well, we need to understand why these books are so important and what they contain and how they may profit us. So the Old Testament, we've talked, we'll talk briefly about the divisions, right? It divides up into 512, 5512. I understand that's only 10, but I don't have 12. So uh, We have the first five books, which are the books of the law, the books of Moses, the Torah, a.k.a. the Pentateuch. Um, we then have the 12 books of history, which we just finished a couple weeks ago. Then we have the five books of wisdom, where we are on book number two of the books of wisdom. We did Job last week. Now we have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, or Psalm of Psalms, depending on... Uh, which translation you have. Uh, then we have the five major prophets, and then we have the 12 minor prophets. Five, 12, five, five, 12. So, the Psalms. The books, as part of the books of wisdom, a lot of people struggle with the fact that the books of wisdom are in the Bible and are inspired because they tend to deal with a lot of worldly issues. And it's kind of strange that people would say that, especially theologians and people who profess to be godly, because who is it who created us as eternal spiritual beings that reside in a physical body within a physical universe? Well, it was God, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Well, then don't we need instruction about dealing with this stuff as well? And the answer is yes. We've talked about the fact that in Genesis, um, the first thing we hear is God speaking to, to Adam. How did Adam know what language was? God taught him. How did Adam know what to eat? God told him. How did Adam know what not to eat? God told him. Um, so, this instruction was from God, and we have this instruction, and sometimes it's about very practical things. Um, one of the strange things to think about is when Eve first had a child, someone had to explain to her why her belly was getting so big, you know? Someone had to explain how that birth was going to take place, and someone had to explain about placentas and umbilical cords, and, you know, they, they couldn't take a Lamaze class, right? Um, so God gave them instruction. Well, God gives us instruction. Everything unto life and godliness. Thus the books of wisdom. We've already talked about the book of Job, that the important lesson that it tells us is that good people from time to time, for particular reasons, suffer. Bad things happen to good people, and it helps us to understand the why 
but more importantly, it helps us to understand that we might overcome. Kind of like what Peter said in 1 Peter, don't, don't think it's strange when these bad things happen to you. It happens to everybody, and especially the persecution that Peter was speaking of to the people of God. It happened to Christ, and we follow his example. In Job, you know, he's a good guy and terrible things have happened to him. Well, he must be a sinner. No, that's not necessarily the truth. Sin is in the world. I mean, ultimately, we can lay it at the foot of sin, but it may not have been Job's sin. Uh, why is Rick going to die someday? Was it because I ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? No, it's because my progenitor, my ancestor and yours, Adam, did. And because of that, the consequences of that sin, I will physically die one day. And everybody deals with physical consequences of sin. When some wahoo in some country decides to invade another, people die and suffer. Because God made that happen? No, because that's the consequences of sin. God allows these things to happen, but uh, that's a different thing. All of that in the book of Job. Well, now we come to the book of Psalms. And it's a difficult book because we have to understand, because Psalms, again, when, when they get their names and we carry over names, we could think, okay, Psalms, well, that's a holy thing. Well, there's a holy aspect to it, but what, what are Psalms, brethren? They're songs. They're songs. There are 150 songs that have been collected, inspired by God to be collected, that these 150, these would be the ones that we have. But they are songs. And that's why we've got to be careful when we look in songs for theology. Because songs are filled with figurative language. It's in the Psalms that we hear about trees clapping their hands and things like that. Well, trees don't clap their hands. No, it's figurative. Even our, in our songs, right? Today, we have all these, my love is like a river, she flows and all, you know, whatever it is. Um, she's so beautiful, she's like a rose. What, what, you mean she's plotted in the earth and she's got thorns and, and she, no, it's figurative. So when we read the Psalms and we pull out theology, because a lot of theology does come from the Psalms, consider our study in Acts. And um, most of Peter's proof that Jesus was the Christ came from the Psalms, didn't it? Yes, it did. But we have to be careful because there are different types of Psalms. And even though songs are filled with figurative language, songs are also filled with uh, true statements. I love my love uh, like the bee loves the flower. I'm just making stuff up. I mean, I do, but I, uh, it's true that I'm not a bee and she's not a flower, but I do love my love, right? That's a true statement. That's a fact. So the Psalms are songs, and thus we got to be careful. The Psalms have been called the heart of Israel because songs are are emotional. They are filled with emotion. We're going to talk about uh, many different types of psalms that we find, and some of them are very uncomfortable um, because they're, they're hoping for bad things to happen to people. And we think, well, that's not Christian. In a sense, that's true. But at the same time, if someone attacks you and they kill your wife and they kill your children and they enslave you, there's an emotion that comes from that. And God created us and he understands that we are emotional beings. He is an emotional being. There are six things that God, yes, yea, seven things that God hates. God loves and God hates. Um, Exodus chapter 20, right? Verses uh, four and five or five and six. God visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children of third and fourth generations of those who hate him. He visits hatred upon them, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who obey him and love him. Um, God is an emotional being. We are an emotional being. And the Psalms 
show us the appropriate expression of much of that emotion. Consider that one statement that Paul quotes from, be angry, but sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because to tell people not to be angry would be foolishness. There are a lot of things in this world that make me very angry when I think of the tens of millions of children slaughtered every year. If you don't get angry at that, then there's something not right with you. But sin not. I don't go blow up a clinic. I don't go sin because of my anger at the sin of the world, right? We are not overcome by evil. We overcome evil by doing good. And we don't let the sun go down on our anger. What does that mean? That means you need to work out this anger and you need to deal with it properly. One of the ways that it's dealt with properly is by means of the Psalms, okay? The expression of emotion in song, okay? Let's understand a little bit about Psalms. <coughs> the Psalms are not written in English. Are you surprised? I hope not. The Psalms were written in Hebrew by Hebrews. And thus their poetry, the style of song is Hebrew. It is not English. Hebrew poetry does not necessarily rhyme. It's not like English, right? Roses are red, violets are blue. My dog smells when it's wet, so do you. Uh, these beautiful love ballads. But it doesn't have to rhyme. Hebrew poetry used something that was called parallelism. And there are seven main types of parallelism. And we're going to look at some of the Psalms, one at least for each one of the types of parallelism, okay? But typically, what it means is instead of comparing words that rhyme, the Hebrews like to compare thoughts. This thought is like this thought. This thought is expressed by this thought. This thought is uh, made more full by this thought. This thought is counter to this thought. Okay, that's their style of poetry. Let's look at some examples. The first example we're gonna look at is called synonymous parallelism, synonymous. In this, the second statement says the same as the first, but in a slightly different way. And this is probably the one we see most of in the Psalms and even in some of the writings of Paul. You'll hear him say, uh, we give praise to God in psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. Is he describing three different things? I don't think so. I think he's being a Hebrew and he's saying the same thing three times. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. What are hymns? Spiritual songs. What are psalms? Spiritual songs. What are spiritual songs? Well, like, you know, like hymns and psalms. <laughs> it's repetition, but in a slightly different way. Look at Psalm 51 and verse 2. A psalm of repentance by David. Notice Psalm 51 and verse 2. David wrote, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. There's the first thought. And cleanse me from my sin. You see, those two statements are basically the same, but just using different words. He said, wash me from iniquity, cleanse me from sin. Wash, cleanse, sin, iniquity. That's the synonymous, saying the same thing over in a slightly different way, okay? <clears throat> the second type is synthetic. The second statement adds to the first. It's not the same thing, just in a different way. It's actually a supplemental thought, synthetic. Turn to Psalm 29 and verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. See, he didn't just say the same thing twice he added something to it. He said, give to the Lord. Okay, give to the Lord 
glory and strength. And if you keep reading, give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty. Okay, this is progressive. That's what synthetic parallelism is. Then there's antithetical. And obviously you can assume from that name, it means that one statement is contrasted with another statement. Look at Psalm, the first Psalm, verse 6. <coughs> Allergies, cough drop. Psalm 1, verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. God is with the righteous, and he knows their way, but the way of the ungodly is not that way. Okay, we're contrasting those things. Those who love the Lord will be taken care of, but those who hate the Lord, they will be punished. That's antithetical. That's the contrasting. Then there's analytical. The second statement gives the consequences of the first. Psalm 23 and verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. What's the result of that? I shall not want. Okay, that's the consequences of allowing the Lord to be my shepherd. I shall not want. He didn't say the Lord is my shepherd. God is my leader. That would be the first kind, right? Synonymous. He didn't do the synthetic. The Lord is my shepherd. He is my king. He watches over me. That would be growing on the things that he does. It's not antithetical. It's not, the Lord is my shepherd, but the wicked are wolves. That would be antithetical and analytical. The Lord is my shepherd. And what's the result of that? I shall not want. The fifth type is comparative or illustrative. And this would be like similes. That's where we take a thought and then we're going to give basically a simile or some kind of way of illustrating that. Um, as the deer, uh, Psalm 42 and verse 1, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul hungers after you. Okay? So the two thought, the thought is, I love the Lord and I can't wait to be in his presence and worship. Kind of like a deer can't wait for water. Okay? That's the comparative. And again, it's just a simile, right? That's what a simile is. Uh, as the deer, right? Pan is the as is makes it a simile or like. Sixth type is climactic, and that is a building, a, a accumulation. And, and I already read that one from Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2, right? Psalm 29, verse 1, was an example of synthetic, where we're having one statement, but then we're adding to it a climactic is we're going to put a couple verses together and it's just going to build up to a mighty climax. And that's what we have. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's just kind of a, a, a snowball that's rolling or a, a gathering up of these thoughts. The last kind that we're going to discuss is tauntological. And tauntological is not about taunting. It's a different thing. It's repetition of phrases. Um, look at Psalm 94 and verse 3. Lord, 94 and verse 3. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? So it's actually he's just stopping and repeating himself. Lord, Lord, how long will the... How long? That's tauntological. So those are seven different types of Hebrew parallelism. Okay, These are the types of, of poetry that you use. Now, now, one psalm doesn't have to all be one part. You can have all seven in the same psalm. So just again, we need to have somewhat a familiarity with poetry, Hebrew poetry, in order to get a, a real true appreciation of the Psalms. There are different categories of Psalms, different purposes for songs, right? Which is what Psalms are. Just like in our world today, we have love songs. We have um, national anthems, which are songs that 
are different things. We have fight songs, right? We're a happy team at Hawthorne. We're the mighty fighting hawks. That's a, a fight song, a club song. Um, we have uh, religious songs. We have melancholy songs, you know, Enter the Cure. Um, we have songs to, to make us sad. We have songs to make us glad. We have jingles. We have uh, all types of different songs. Well, same thing with the Psalms. There are many different Psalms, songs, used for or expressing different aspects of the people of God. There are Psalms of praise. I wonder what that could mean. A song that praises God. One of my favorites is uh, <clears throat> the last Psalm, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And in case you didn't get it, praise the Lord. That would be a psalm of praise, wouldn't it? That is a song where the purpose is praising God. And there are many, many of those. There are psalms of instruction. Um, look at Psalm 19. These are psalms that would be used as teaching tools. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he, God, has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep me your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. That would be a great psalm for our children to know, because it's just teaching you how wonderful God is, how he's in control of all, he sees all, he's above all, he's in all, and he's given us his word. And, it, and all the things that if we will follow his word that we will be given and we will have. How wonderful is the word of God. It's instructive. So psalms of praise, psalms of instruction. There are ethical psalms. Similar to instructive psalms, but explaining the type of people we should be. Think of the first psalm. Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of God day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the river, right? He doesn't uh, uh, stand with the ungodly. He doesn't uh, um, walk with the sinners, and he doesn't sit with the scoffers. Um, there's a contrasting thing. The man of God, this is how he is. And then the second half of the psalm says, oh, but the ungodly are not like that. They do this, but the man of God does this. There's your ethical psalm. Be like this guy. 
not like these guys. There are psalms of worship. And what's meant there, because you can say, well, isn't praise worship? Well, kind of. Um, but you don't have to be worshiping to praise God. When I say, oh, praise God, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm worshiping. Um, but the psalms of worship were actually psalms that were used to worship God under the Jewish system. Many of them are called the songs of ascent. Ascent, as you're rising up. Remember, Jerusalem was up on a mountaintop and the temple and one of the top of one of those mountains. So they would sing these psalms, songs, as they were on their way to worship. Um, and they'd be singing together, and that's what those songs are. They're, it's time to worship. Come on, everybody. Let's go worship our God. Great is our God. Let's go do it. So songs of worship. 